special privilege of being the last living relative of Tesla carrying in one quarter measure blo blood identical to that of Tesla himself. Also, with the advantage of travel with his mother, having met with Tesla at the New Yorker Hotel in 1938 or 1940. Mr. Terbo's activities over the last 40 years have been combination of privilege, honor, and duty. Please welcome Mr. William Terbo. A few things I want to talk about this uh, uh, afternoon uh, are uh, involved in some aspects of that personality. Um, it's been a lifelong experience for me. Uh, as I say, 86 years old. Uh, I, I used to say I was going to make it to 100. Now I've set it to 105. And uh, I'm still working on that above 105. But it has nothing Tesla to do. said that he will, he want to live like 140 yes. or something. Okay. Uh, he was good in invention, not so good in mathematics. So <laughs> he he uh, he did realize when I met him, uh, you know, as they say, how could I possibly know Tesla? Well, I met Tesla when I was around ten years old, and uh, I have already published in the uh, new published publication of a, a book about Tesla's correspondence with relatives that, that was just republished again uh, about a year ago. And I wrote the afterword for that. And in that afterword, I described something that it took me 70 years at least to figure out what was going on. Because when I met Tesla as a young boy, and I know that uh, it was just my mother and myself that were visiting New York. Uh, she dressed me up so that I was ready to go to uh, Radio City Music Hall. And I was interested in doing that. And then she tricked me a little bit as his first we're going to see uh, Uncle uh, Nicola. And um, uh, I wasn't terribly interested in doing that, but uh, what can I do? Uh, it's, it's my stop before the Radio City Music Hall. And what I didn't realize at the time, that uh, Tesla had a, a, such a, a lot of idiosyncrasies, or affectations, however you want to call it, that he was always a little aloof in meeting people. It was like he wanted to protect himself from meeting people. Yet when I met him, uh, he hugged me and kissed me and uh, mussed my hair and... It was it strange that he it, kissed me. It, it's all strange. It, at the time, I didn't think about it because I had been brought up more in the uh, English way of doing it and I expected to shake hands with him, not uh, that I'd be grabbed and hugged and kissed by, by this elderly guy who almost had to get on his hands and knees in order to, to do it. He was pretty really tall. Um, and, uh, I thought at that time that this was a good indication. As I say, for 40 years, he was simply my, my father's uh, uncle. And we all knew who he was and what his inventions were, because my father was also a very famous inventor. And uh, he had a long uh, lifetime uh, discussion with Tesla, speaking in technology and also family matters. But. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out why did I get this, this warm welcome because he wasn't interested in meeting my mother because he was, uh, I'm sure, was suspected that my mother was there. My mother was calling this meeting to, to uh, ask him some questions about uh, his financial state. Uh, uh, like, uh, is he, is, has he got any money? Does he need more money? My mother, my mother wasn't too happy about my father giving him so much money. Uh, and my father had it actually, instead of giving him some money, had invested in some of his inventions. And one was uh, actually a pretty successful invention. And uh, she was there probably to ask, uh, what is the status of that? I didn't have uh, participation in that conversation at all because I was sort of, as a kid, just sort of dumps, dumbstruck uh, uh, in meeting, uh, meeting this uh, very old fellow. But it took me about, 70 years until I got of a certain age, and I figured out what was it that Tesla saw in me that made him so uh, warm and welcoming? Well, we have a uh, family uh, situation together. Uh, Tesla had an older brother, 
named Dana, who was killed tragically. He was killed in a, a horse accident. A horse tripped and fell on him and killed him. My own, my own brother, older brother, also had a tragic accident. He went to, to visit some friends. They were climbing in a tree. He fell into the tree and was killed on the spot. The sort of the reason that made it so special is that I was seven years old when that happened and Tessa was about seven years old when it happened and my brother was 13 years old and Tessa's brother was about 13 years old and he saw that uh, tragic comparison that he knew how his mother felt about losing the son and how it influenced his choice of career and how strong his mother was in keeping him from becoming a Serbian Orthodox priest, as was normally going to be the situation with the firstborn. And it, it was a similar situation with me, and I thought that he, as I say, I had to get to be 70 years old before it came to me that that was an actual possibility. Uh, and it, it is a tragic and a very sentimental situation for me. I was sort of forced into writing uh, afterward for this Tesla's uh, communication with relatives, which about one third of the book is between Tesla and my father. But uh, I finally put that down on paper and uh, I made a copy if people want it. I, I, for a long time I didn't distribute that at all because it's uh, too sentimental for me, but it is important to see another facet of Nikola Tesla that, that I perceived and that I would like other people to also perceive that he had a, a certain uh, soft spot in him in a family situation that was different than, he always was very good with his family, but it, it's different than the, the public perception of Tesla. Another aspect of how I'm able to speak about the personality of uh, Nikola Tesla is that my father was born within walking distance of where Tesla was uh, born and raised. Um, and uh, my father was also a Serbian Orthodox priest, a relatively high one, what they call proto. He, he was the head of the Serbian Orthodox Church for the county of Lika, which is a, a part of the military frontier area. And uh, so he had the same background, but Time moves very slowly in those days, and even though Tessa was 30 years older than my father, and my father's whole history it, it, it came 30 years later than Tesla. He came to the United States 30 years after Tesla. He died 30 years after Tesla. So, uh, but I had the opportunity to speak with my father, who was telling me about how things were in Lika back in uh, uh, my father was born in 1886, uh, Tesla in 1856, uh, and I, I, I knew a lot of the sort of the uh, home life of, of that area. And that home life, no matter how prominent you become in world affairs, you have that as the seed of your beginning. And so I think that uh, uh, I, Tesla and my father had some common interests and also some arguments w with each other because uh, Tesla was uh, looking at my father's success as a potential source of more revenue for his uh, inventions. But uh, as, as it came to be, uh, it was a worthwhile uh, uh, parallel between the two. So I had a chance to see how Tesla was reacting as a young boy in a manner so similar to the way my father was acting as a young boy. Not as an ordinary young boy, but as a very uh, um, active and intelligent type. Sometimes too intelligent for their own good because they, they were uh, doing things that a lot of adults couldn't do. And uh, that was uh, uh, sometimes n not to make you more popular with your neighbors. But it, at least it gave me a chance to, to see some background of Tesla that most of the people who write the novels about it, uh, I, how many uh, uh, 
biographies of Tesla have been published. I don't know. I have at least 40 in my, uh, in my own archive. Uh, and believe it or not, there are some people who are writing novels who are not calling me on the phone first to find out what I have to say about it. Uh, and I, some of them come to solutions to uh, one particular uh, is a, a university professor who uh, thought this all up on his own, and uh, he came to conclusions that I thought were uh, uh, a little presumptuous. So uh, I have that possibility. Then I have another aspect in how I have seen Tesla work. Uh, I was, uh, through, through some connections that I have, I was exposed to a... Uh, archive that had been uh, hidden for 40 years. It was uh, a material that Tesla was writing letters to uh, Edward Dean uh, uh, Adams. Adams. Uh, yeah, Edward Dean Adams, uh, the uh, president of the Cataract Construction Company that was in charge of the uh, managing the uh, conversion of Niagara Falls from previous type of uh, electrical energy to the current uh, electrical energy. And uh, these letters, I saw in the handwritten letters that Tesla, because Tesla had an advantage. He was in <coughs> New York. Edward Dean Adams was the fellow that was uh, selected by J.P. Morgan and other big investors to see that the money was going to be well spent. Uh, and he was very good in that area, but he knew his own shortcomings. And he, after being introduced to Nikola Tesla, started relying on him a little bit to field some of the uh, opportunities that, some, that people were uh, uh, taking, uh, contacting Cataract, thinking that so much money was going to be spent, there must be some part of the job that they could do better than anybody else. And uh, Nikola Tesla used the grace, the grace and the uh, competence, technical competence, and the, the grace in the way he handled the writing, not to insult any of these people, but to simply explain to them a better way to do it than they were suggesting, and then to report to uh, uh, Mr. Adams that uh, uh, this, this fellow is not ready to do the projects that he's uh, suggested to do. Tesla had in his mind, and that's where the part of the grace came into it, Tesla had into his mind long before the proposition of re-electrifying Niagara Falls came to pass, that he had in his mind that the way to do it was with his alternating current uh, uh, electrical s solutions, which now were in the hands of uh, uh, George Westinghouse uh, as, a, as a, uh, a person who could actually create these turbines, these enormous turbines. And they knew what it was going to be a tremendous leap ahead, but Tesla knew what the ultimate solution was going to be. Instead of trying to push Adams to that solution, he let Adams push Tesla to that solution. Uh, very cleverly, I had the chance to read uh, fif these 15 letters, most of them hand handwritten on hotel stationery because he had a con connection. Being in Manhattan, uh, George Westinghouse was in, uh, in uh, uh, Pittsburgh or in uh, Chicago where the uh, uh, Columbian World's Fair was going to be uh, in uh, 1893. Uh, so they were separate apart. And they, I know that Tesla was doing this independent of Westinghouse, but with the same objective that, that uh, Westinghouse had. So uh, to just describe what kind of jump forward this was going to be uh, to electrify uh, even with Tesla's fundamental uh, inventions, that uh, a, a generator in those days was usually uh, about uh, 150 horsepower. They were making generators 5,000 horsepower. They had transformers, and transformers were generally for transforming about uh, uh, 10 horsepower of uh, electricity. They were going to be transforming 1,250 horsepower of uh, transformer. Those jumps are like inventing a jet against Wright Brothers' uh, original plane. Uh, but Tesla was confident, and he 
George Westinghouse was also confident because I give George Westinghouse tremendous credit. Uh, he took the idea of electrifying the uh, World's Fair in Chicago in 1893 with uh, Tesla patents of electricity. Now, uh, Thomas Edison thought that he was going to get the contract to do that and he was going to make some money on it. So he, he found, they found out what Edison was going to bid for the contract. And George Westinghouse came in and simply undercut uh, uh, Edison by 20 or 30 percent. So the people said, you can do it. What did uh, uh, Thomas Edison say? Well, you can do it, but you can't do it with the uh, Edison light bulbs. But uh, uh, George Westinghouse already had a contract with some people in, in uh, uh, France to make a different type of light bulb. He, as the expression goes, he bet the farm. He made more light bulbs for that Columbian Exposition with the regular bulbs that were showing and uh, predicting how much uh, their turnover there was going to be because these bulbs were not the quality that they should have been. Edison had a better quality light bulb. He made, he manufactured more light bulbs in that one project than ever had been made in the whole world up to that point, uh, regardless how many light bulbs that Edison was making and, and complaining how good they were. So uh, that's part of the reason that of all the great uh, uh, capitalists of those, of those times that uh, Tesla and George Westinghouse were friendly. George Westinghouse himself was a, a very uh, honest type person. He took after, his, he looked after his workers better than anybody else did. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a, like a saint in Pittsburgh because he did so much for that, uh, for that uh, uh, company, that, that city and everybody. So I have these ways of looking at how Tesla, what, what qualities did Tesla show that are above and beyond the qualities that we all say that Tesla was son of a Serbian Orthodox uh, minister. My father was the son of a Serbian Orthodox minister. It made them have this a little more ecclesiastic idea of what the object of your being on earth was about. It was not about becoming wealthy. It was not uh, about discovering something brand new, but it was about helping people in general, uh, doing something positive for society. And if doing that positive thing for society meant that you were able to invent something new that was going to open new areas for, for society that were going to change the way, as Alternating Current did, change the way of people actually having to dig a canal, to having equipment, electrically, electrically operated equipment, uh, uh, do some of the work for you, to decrease the, the, the back-breaking labor that was done. The, it, it's shown most clearly in what were the, the living standards, what were the lifetime standards in, in uh, uh, 1800, if you lived to 50 years old, you were, you were old. Even in 1900, if you lived to 50 or 55 years old, you were old. This whole concept of Social Security in 1935, when uh, it was proposed by uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, they thought that if you uh, were able to uh, retire at 65 years old, there wouldn't be anybody to retire at 65 years old. So it was going to be a, a, positive, a positive system. Uh, they didn't know that everybody was going to live now to 86 years old or to uh, uh, 105. Uh, so uh, uh, this concept, this really concept, it has its good part in trying to do the best for, for humanity that you can. It has the bad part is that you are thrown in with a lot of wolves who are uh, uh, using uh, technology for personal gain and for advancement themselves. Not that that's bad, but it means that, that the objective is different. Uh, you sound you're a little bit too much of like a goody-goody two-shoes to be doing something for society in general. 
rather than doing something to build up a personal wealth. These people who have now made enormous wealth, but they made it in an interesting way that is, you can't complain about it. That if you invented something that turned out to be Google and you make, make tens of billions of dollars from it, mm -hmm. how can you complain about that? Because there was no Google before. I use Google myself and I, I'm very nicely situated with Google for other reasons, but uh, uh, I use Google myself in that they, when I was in the computer business a long time ago, uh, in order to put a, a computer that you can put in your shirt pocket now that does very good work, we had to build three, uh, three uh, 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 yeah, cabinets, three cabinets full of uh, stuff. And when a dollar was a dollar, it, the cheapest computer you could get was fifty thousand dollars. And, uh, and it was two cabinets full of equipment. And that, cab that right now, you, for $25, you can put that in your shirt pocket. Um, the thing that bothered people up to that, that bothered me in the computer business was that you couldn't store anything. Storing, storage was uh, uh, almost a hidden art. But that uh, part of technology in, in improved so much it, it, not even decade by decade, but almost year by year. So that now when you have an email account with Google, they'll store a lifetime worth of stuff. And I have a lifetime worth of stuff that they're storing for me just by deciding uh, which, which folder everything's supposed to go into so that I can call it back any time I want. Uh, it, 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 so I can't complain that uh, Larry Page and Serge Brin uh, that uh, are making billions of dollars off of Google. I do complain about some other people that are making billion dollars off of doing nothing really important. Uh, what's, the, what's the name of the, the, uh, the, the worst family on TV now? Kardashians, Kardashians. I knew I, I didn't. I knew I didn't have to think of it myself. I knew I just have to mention who the worst family on television is. What on earth have they done? Absolutely nothing, except put a torpedo into uh, modern society. So uh, it's uh, it's not a good situation. So really, that is the areas that I want to talk about, um, and I think I've described in in certain ways. Uh, I have the advantage of having my father with a background. I have the advantage of meeting Tesla myself and having a, a second re recollection of what really w what we were talking about. That uh, uh, I've had uh, 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 this idea of this uh, I, uh, of the. Con uh, actual construction of the electrical system in, in Niagara Falls, and how, uh, not only how clever, you c uh, clever, uh, clever is a bad, a bad word to use, uh, brilliant, brilliant, but the clever part comes in, in uh, uh, applying a certain psychology to the way he was working that would let the, the president of the company choose himself what was going to be the solution that Tesla had in mind for maybe 20 years before. I just to let you know that we are going live on the internet. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, and can you put the uh, mic closer? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I mentioned something that just when you say you're going live on the internet, uh, I dedicated the statue on the uh, uh, Canadian side of Niagara Falls. Uh, and I, I spoke very nicely about it. I, I, I was the last person to speak. I actually had the German television uh, there at the time, but the uh, uh, producer of the television, he had left the day before to go to uh, Belgrade to, uh, take a, uh, to uh, participate in the naming of the international airport in Belgrade for Nikola Tesla. And so this uh, cameraman that was there, it didn't occur to him that maybe he should be taking a picture of me speaking English because it was simultaneously interpreted as I spoke, as everybody in the program spoke. It was a, 
our program live to, to Serbia. And of course, when it, it was inter uh, I was introduced at the second to the last person because I'm the one that they pulled the, the cover off of the statue and I went there to put blood uh, on my finger to join the blood of Tesla with the statue of Tesla. And I chose, I chose to not, not to put the blood on, the, on his head, but to put the blood on his heart. I, I get a little bit uh, uh, sentimental about that. And I, to this day, I still don't have what I said ex specifically. I spoke extemporaneously off of some notes. I was a little bit uh, irritated at the Serbians at that particular time because uh, they were going to introduce the airport and I was, into, and I was blessing a statue. But uh, uh, in my workup, in the two and a half or three minutes that I spoke, I mentioned that uh, I was married to a Serbian woman uh, uh, and I mentioned her by name Bojana Djurjevic was her, her maiden name, and uh, she was listening live on television in Serbia, and she tells me that she nearly fainted <laughs> when she heard, heard her name uh, mentioned specifically, uh, because I was trying to say uh, sort of hello to her as part of my uh, uh, remarks about uh, dedicating this statue of Tesla. I wish now, I know that the, the uh, people who built the statue, the Serbian Orthodox Church there, that they took, uh, they made a film of it. And for reasons that I cannot figure out, they have not given me a copy of my remarks. So even though I spoke and people were crying, uh, I went over to, to put the blood on the forehead of some woman who was going to faint at any moment uh, behind the line. Uh, and people came to me, uh, you know, grown, healthy young men came to me, were crying uh, about honoring Tesla in that particular manner. And I still don't have it. So if, she's, if she happens to be listening or hears the broadcast of that, I can say uh, that my wife, Bojana Djurjevic, is a Serbian and uh, she spends all summer in Serbia. And, uh, I'm running loose here in the uh, in, uh, United States. And how you feel? You have some part of Serbian blood? Of course I have, uh, but I have, I have the worst combination of, of uh, uh, ethnic background. Both cra completely crazy people. On my father's side, Serbian. On my mother's side, Scottish. Of all the crazy people in the world, it, it, there's a f they, always the joke about the uh, British Army, because lot, oh, so many Scots are in the British Army, that the British colonel comes up before the uh, uh, group uh, uh, of soldiers saying, I have a very dangerous uh, uh, mission for you to, to do. I have to tell you in advance that it's going to be so dangerous that not all of you are going to come back. But do I have any volunteers at all? All the British soldiers took one step back and all the Scottish soldiers put their head up, me, me, me. <laughs> so, so, and Serbian, the Serbian have a military background that is so similar that they are uh, involved in, have been involved in fighting the Ottoman Empire in so many different ways and for so long and have done really good work in ending the, Adam, the end of the Ottoman Empire. My father was born in a, in a place in Lika called Lichko Petrovicelo, which is less than one mile from the border, border of Bosnia, when Bosnia was a part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so uh, that's, why, that, that's what the military frontier is about. They were farmers that were also active soldiers. So if the uh, if the uh, uh, Muslims came in, the Ottomans came in, that they were, they were to meet people who were willing to die rather than to give up the land. My father tells me from his childhood, because he had uh, so many tell, tales to tell me, he says that in, uh, in Lika, uh, the man with uh, missing one arm or missing one leg 
was the most handsome man in town because the women were always after him that he must be the good blood for the next generation because he was fighting uh, with great pain and, and problem. And let's back uh, to the Tesla's personality. Uh, you were a uh, nine, ten years old boy when you met him. Yes. Uh, do you remember his voice? Because it's contradictory. Yeah. Many people have asked me that, that question because they say that Tesla had a somewhat higher pitched voice. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, when he spoke to me, he spoke to me in regular voice. But I wasn't paying attention to such thing of whether he spoke to me like Mickey Mouse or he spoke to me like uh, one of these uh, better actors that has a, has a voice that uh, you will remember for the rest of the day. Uh, so I don't remember even thinking about, about his voice. And unfortunately, there is no film, uh, 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 talky type film, and there are no uh, interviews uh, that were recorded that exist. I know this I is strange because it was the uh, era when the uh, film was going up, you know. That's right. Uh, uh, Tesla was uh, at the height of his fame in, say, 1900, but his fame continued uh, through the 20s and in, into the 30s. Uh, there certainly were, were plenty of opportunities. I dealt with a very prominent uh, uh, Hollywood uh, company that was going to do a film on Tesla, and uh, they called me up, as I, a lot of people call me up, because I have all sorts of pictures from my childhood and, uh, and back, uh, and, and, a, and a personal understanding of these things. Um, and we together, and I was in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, we together searched around the best we could to find anything. And we could not find a, even a motion picture of Tesla, much less a talkie. And uh, my only way of saying why didn't uh, recorder, reporters who were interviewing him on a regular basis, why they didn't bring a recording device? Well, in, in the 1930s, uh, a recording device was not some small thing. You have an interview now with some famous person, you're sitting at a table, you take out your recording device, put it in the middle of the table and say, okay, let's start. And every word is recorded. It never happened. And uh, this is the Jack Haley company, in uh, a, a motion picture production company. And they spent a lot of time with me uh, as well uh, and searching around. And only thing I can say is that in some attic someplace, somebody has a recording that is going to be like these uh, letters to Tesla that I said that were hidden for 40 years that nobody knew about. It. The museum doesn't know about it. The museum still doesn't know about it because I have not given them copies. I have copies of every one of these letters. But I, I, and good quality, good quality copies, but not the real, not the real letters. I tried to get the real letters, but uh, there were other reasons that they found out that, that these things were worth something, because uh, I wasn't willing to pay. I was willing to do a service for Tesla, not, not to pay. But uh, uh, that sometime in, in when somebody is cleaning out uh, an uh, uh, elderly man's uh, belongings from the attic, and they're going to find some picture or some recording or something that is going to give some substance to that word. If he had a higher pitched voice, uh, because he spoke many times uh, in, in lectures and things of that nature, uh, so I think that it may be something perceived by the listener rather than by the actual, his actual voice. But uh, his voice uh, could have been higher but where is higher? Is higher when it is unattractive, or is it higher because he's getting more energized in what he's talking about? I can't, I can't believe that. You see, I don't get too energized about anything, so my voice can go right down. 
Yeah, and how you can explain that, that there is no movie, there is no film, there is no audio about Tesla? There is no reason for him to make a movie. Edison already was so, so prom uh, prominent in that, and the French, comp French company was very prominent in that. But uh, even though a lot of artists, famous artists, made films and were, uh, found, were uh, interviewed uh, or took part in actual films uh, in, in a theatrical sense, uh, it, never, it never really occurred to uh, uh, Tesla to do that specifically because he was available to speak to people uh, at any time. And I think it was considered impolite for a recording, for a reporter to come with some unattractive piece of equipment because there were no, no clever pieces of recording equipment at that time. I have, a, in, my own, in my own lifetime, I, wire recorders were quite uh, common, not common, but were quite readily available at that time. And I, as I saw my father was declining a little bit as he was getting older, that I wanted to get a wire recorder and sit down with my father for as many hours as he could stand. He, he had a good energy, but he was uh, uh, getting older and uh, uh, getting a little uh, emphysema. But uh, I, I would, I know how I missed it, how I missed it. Even my mother was taking pictures all the time. Or, or, or Kodak type pictures. Uh, she had a really good quality Kodak picture. She was taking pictures of the Radio City Music Hall. She wasn't taking pictures of me and Tesla. I can't explain any of these things. These are things that you think in later time. What was wrong with me? Why didn't I think of doing that? Why didn't I think of getting a good wire recorder that took good quality uh, sound and ask my father about all of the, you know, he had such a background in, in invention. He was dealing with all the top people at General Motors. Uh, the, only, the only car company that didn't use my father's uh, inventions was Ford. And he, had an, he told me he had an interview with Ford uh, and he thought they were going to sign up to use my father's hypoid gear, which was very popular in 1930, 31, 32. Uh, and uh, he says he went there for the uh, thinking that he was going to uh, make arrangements for a contract for Ford to use it because uh, all the different departments of General Motors were already using it. And he says he know that uh, Henry Ford was sitting in the background, not, not at the table to talk. And instead of wanting to sign a, uh, a, a licensing agreement for the, for the uh, high point gear that my father was promoting, that uh, they wanted to hire my father. And if, if they knew what kind of money my father was making off of royalties from the high point gear, that th their, their offer was like 10% of what he was making. Uh, it, it was r ridiculous. You know, so uh, uh, I have a certain uh, animus toward uh, Ford because they had a chance to, to make their uh, sporty Ford cars better by using this gear, because the gear lasted forever. I, I speak to people now in the automobile business and they say when they're tearing down Rolls Royces and, and big Mercedes and, and uh, high value rear drive cars, uh, that those, they take the uh, uh, differential out and the gear is in the differential and it's still in good condition. If, it, if it's been lubricated just a little bit, uh, so uh, that is a, a problem uh, in that respect as well. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, the article about the ball lightning. Can you, can you tell us before Q&A session uh, what is the ball lightning and uh, Tesla also, he, he made it. Uh, it, it I had just an accidental opportunity when I was at Purdue and uh, I stayed in, I, I lived in, not on campus, I lived in the uh, uh, house of one of my professors. Uh, I, I, the second floor was my, was my floor and uh, he was, and, and if anybody knows football, Hank Stram was the uh, other fellow living with the professor, he lived over the garage. 
uh, but uh, in Indiana, you have uh, thunderstorms that are unbelievable to people that uh, haven't experienced it. Uh, I've been hit by lightning so many times that it's, uh, you, they say, if I've been hit by lightning, why am I de de calling the uh, EPS or whatever it is to uh, revive me? But I was always in a car. And when it's raining hard and the, the, the water's on the outside of the car, you can be hit in the car. You're hit, all right, no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, uh, in one of these storms that it was raining so hard and it was kind of hot and humid, and I opened the window only about four inches, just a little, little bit of cool air coming in. My mother happened to be visiting me. She lived in Detroit, and she happened to be visiting me for a, a week or so at that particular time, and she was uh, staying in the uh, house, in, in uh, Professor Lasko's house as well. And uh, uh, she was on one side of the table, I was on the other side of the table, and lightning was hitting all the time. And what happened is that uh, a, a ball of plasma, that's what ball lightning is, it's actually plasma, it came down, evidently hit the uh, roof of the house, came down the water pipe, and as it came next to my window that was open this much, this ball lightning that was about, this is about three inches here, and it was really about six inches, so it had to do a lot of work to squeeze through that open part. That, uh, this was red hot plasma. By red hot, no, no indication of how, what the temperature was, but it was alive. It went on the uh, sill of the window, fell about four inches to this uh, uh, steel table, uh, uh, enameled steel table. And while I'm looking there, my, my mother was on the other side of the thing, uh, transfixed. <laughs> she, she didn't know what this was about, but I'm an engineer, or I, 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 close to being an engineer at this particular time. I was about five years into it. Uh, and I looked at it because it was kind of wallowing across the way, and uh, I was, uh, you know, engineer says, um, uh, what is this really? Should I, I have my finger thinking, should I stick it in there? Uh, I'm, Engineers try not to do any damage when they, when they uh, do some repair work of some sort. So I thought maybe I shouldn't do that. It slowly rolled across the table, came to the edge where there's a little trough to, to stop uh, ordinary spills from falling over. And instead of falling down on the ground, it went straight across to another uh, metal cabinet where we store dishes. It hit that cabinet like I took a full swing with a Louisville slugger bat. It made such a, a bang, and that was it. It disappeared. It just at the hinges, there were, were uh, soot marks around the hinges where it was. This was interesting to me. Ten years later, I happened to be at a cocktail party with a lot of uh, academic people, of whom I didn't know many of them at all, or any of them uh, to speak, and I was holding my drink, and uh, three fellows were standing near a stairwell, and they were saying something about ball lightning. It turned out one of them is, was a doctorate, a doctor already, but studying ball lightning. And he was explaining to the others, how come he's having such a problem? So I just simply went over and said, listen, I've been a personal, uh, a personal uh, 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 visitor with ball lightning. He couldn't believe it, because in all of the research that he'd done, he'd already gotten 25 or 30 uh, interviews with people who claimed to see ball lightning, none of them were really uh, not, not unbelievable, but they were people too, these were common people that didn't understand any of the technology that was involved, and, and I was a person who really was able to explain exactly what was going on. Uh, I took that opportunity, it was t like 10 years later, I took that opportunity to put that down on paper and I have a copy if somebody wants to see it, because it is probably the best personal experience with real ball lightning. Now, Nikola Tesla was always interested in ball lightning. And I mentioned even in the paper I wrote, I know somebody else that risked his life trying to develop ball lightning. But in some of these uh, uh, high frequency uh, eruptions that Tesla had for his, uh, uh, like Tesla coil, uh, is little tiny bits of ball lightning would appear, and he was recognizing them and speaking about them specifically, but 
what I saw was a thousand times more important than what he was seeing. Uh, and so I took that as an opportunity even many years ago. You can see the typeface is a different typeface. That's two computers ago. Uh, so uh, I, have, I have it available, and I, and I, I, I know Nadad said that you want to publish it. It's been published before in, in, in a couple of technical magazines. But I don't hear people calling me up on the phone and saying, because my name and telephone number and anything are right there, and nobody calls me up. But uh, this is probably the best example of a, of a, a real personal experience with, with a very active ball lightning. It, I don't know much about ball lightning other than that it, very specifically it's, it's a demonstration of plasma. And uh, it looks dangerous to put your finger in it. Okay, uh, if you, we can start with sure. a Q&A session. Is there some question? Okay, I will ask a few. Okay, <laughs> what question do you have? Uh, there is a, some kind of, I, I wouldn't say war, but some battle arguing between Croats and Serbs about uh, Tesla. What is your opinion? Is Tesla Croats or Serb or what he, American or what he is? Well, it's, is, is it important, actually? It, 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 it's always important. Uh, you see, uh, Tesla, I have a letter that Tesla himself wrote uh, in which he said specifically that regardless where he was born, that he was a Serb. He was not born in uh, Croatia. He was born and that's one thing, when I first got involved in uh, promoting Tesla in his, his personality and what have you, even the uh, encyclopedias were misstating where he was born. He was actually born in Austria just before the, uh, about three years before the uh, uh, joining of Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian Empire that he was born not in uh, Croatia, he was born in the military frontier part, which was separate from Croatia. Uh, in, uh, there, were, there were Croatians living there, but uh, Emperor Leopold uh, decided in 17-something uh, or other to invite the Serbs, who, who were well known of having been fighting the Ottomans, who were well known, he invited them to come to to uh, you know, what was then Austria, and the, the arrangement he made was very specific, that they, he was there invited to come, they could practice their religion, they could own land, which was not available uh, generally for the peasants there in that area, but uh, you, you could own land, but you were to be an active soldier, farmer and active soldier at the same time. And uh, that continued, uh, uh, up into the middle 1800s. Um, and it's one reason that a lot of Serbs also left from that uh, Lika and those areas that are associated with uh, Croatia now. Uh, they left because they uh, no longer had the special arrangement with the uh, Austrian monarchy. That, monarch that ended long before the First World War. Uh, but uh, it was a reason for people to uh, say that they had changed the rules of the game of why you were in the military frontier. And many people then left. I don't say that Tesla left because of that at all, but Tesla left because he had a mind that required a bigger area to e exploit uh, and show his, his uh, uh, brilliance and his, his inventiveness. And what is your conclusion? Uh, it, 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 that uh, Nikola Tesla said himself, now they ran into some politics because uh, there was a, a, in the Second World War, the uh, Croats uh, joined with the Nazis uh, to expel the uh, uh, Serbians from uh, what was, was then Croatia. We were lucky because we were, uh, 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 we had the background that we have, but uh, 
it, it was a very bad situation. But after, as the war ended then, the, uh, uh, Tito wanted to reunite the uh, country. And uh, so uh, there was a, a kind of a push to say that if you were born in what was Croatia, that you were Croatian. It, it, it was, he was Serbian, without any question. Um, that doesn't mean that the Croatians are doing something bad uh, about uh, wanting to take uh, a claim to him because the people in Graz and in, in, in uh, uh, Austria want to take credit for him. The people in Hungary want to take credit for him as well. Everybody wants to take credit for him. If you want to take credit for him and admire what he's done, I'm not against that at all. But if you want, you want to take it to take away from somebody else, which is the true area of it, that's not, that's not good. Okay, thank you. Is there a question? Okay. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you heard that Romanians wrote a book claiming that uh, Nikola Tesla's family is originating, uh, uh, basically they are Romanians. Even now in Croatia live maybe 500 uh, uh, Romanians that settled uh, maybe four or five hundred years ago in Croatia and uh, Romanians wrote a book claiming that uh, Nikola Tesla is basically Nikolaus Teslaus, that he's Romanian. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I haven't been exposed to that book uh, and I, if they want to claim that he's Romanian, uh, more power to them. They can claim uh, as long as they honor him in, for what he's done and what he's done for society in general. Uh, I, I know because I have in my briefcase, which I have here someplace, uh, I guess I left it up there, I have the Trebojevic genealogy, 250 pages of Trebojevic's. Uh, it starts, my, my grandfather, and uh, Angelina Tesla was my grandmother, uh, and I go back three more generations behind that because uh, you can follow these family values because when you're in a clerical situation, everything is marked down in the church. So everybody knows who was born and who is dying in all these times and it takes uh, even more than a world war to, to interrupt that particular uh, arrangement. So uh, uh, I know part of the family has, has the name uh, of Tesla's mother, uh, Mandic, which is a very famous name among uh, uh, Serbs. Uh, many served, you know, in the First World War, the uh, uh, Austrian Serbs fought for the Austrian side. Uh, and the one, one, I know that my, my mother who used to say that one of her uh, uh, close relatives was a, uh, in the uh, King's Horse Guards or something uh, in Britain. And uh, my father would say, well, but one of my relatives was a, a field marshal in the Austrian army, <laughs> better, than, better than the King's Horse Guard. And another uh, uh, relative was the head of the military academy for Austria. It doesn't mean that, uh, that politically it was more appropriate to switch to be Catholic than to continue being Serbian. But, but there were Serbians by, by Heart. Okay, next. I'm just curious, um, on the exposition um, where they had over 200,000 light bulbs, and I think you mentioned that that was probably the largest amount of light bulbs that ever produced at one time in the world at that point. Oh yeah, it, it, it's not more, it was, it was in the order of 10 times more that it, uh, George Westinghouse, that's why I say he, essentially bet the farm. He undercut uh, Edison in order to get the uh, contract to use alternating current and Tesla was uh, a prominent uh, doing experiments. Uh, uh, it was one of the hits of the uh, uh, 1993 World's Fair. Uh, but uh, uh, Edison then said that he was not going to sell, uh, not going to give, sell or make available to uh, Westinghouse Edison light bulbs. But he had an alternate source, but not the, not the quality of the Tesla light bulbs. But they, they you've, seen, you've seen pictures of this uh, 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 electrical display uh, of the 1993 World's Fair. 
the, it is, it's just a glow with lights. He knew that he was going to have to make twice as many bulbs as he was going to use because they didn't have the lifetime. Uh, they had corks in the bottom rather than uh, sealed. I was just curious how did they manufacture them in a short time? I, he, he, luckily, George Westinghouse is, he, he's like an Elon Musk in, in, in some regards there. He had a little lead time and he knew that, that uh, he was not going to get uh, Edison light bulbs. And he had, he, I think they were made in France. I'm not positive, but I think they were made in France because the patent for them was a French patent. And uh, he knew how many he was going to take and he knew what quality they were, how long they were going to last, and I believe he he had built uh, he had built twice the number that they needed, so they would have replacements to keep everything lit the whole time. It cost it cost uh, George Westinghouse every cent that he had in this part of his empire because he had several different companies. George Westinghouse was a little different when he had. Uh, uh, Westinghouse air brake for the railroads. That's a separate company. But he was interested in alternating current for a long time and he'd picked up a lot of patents uh, of people that had alternating current until he found out about Tesla that had the answer to everything. But in that time he had connections with the French and I think that he had a lead time. Uh, I'm sure that if there's a contract there, you can make them faster than you even believe you could make. Whether they were of the top quality, that's another question, but uh, they did the job. It was you know, 10 times more light bulbs than had ever been made before, than, Ed than Edison ever made. John, next. Yeah, um, in a day and age where we're so reliant on electricity and the grid's very vulnerable, uh, and we could literally be back, set back to the Stone Ages, uh, how careless do you think Nicholas would, would think that we don't have these built-in safeguards where we could have uh, like another Carrington event or just EMP from, you know, uh, an enemy? What do you think he would have done his, his approach to yeah, 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 safeguard yeah, yeah, the vulnerability that we're in right now? Give me a, 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 another rundown of that question. Do um, you want me to just put it in another way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> If the grid were to go down tomorrow, why? Oh, the grid. You're talking. Okay. Yeah, just no. uh, yeah, just lights out. Mm -hmm. Nicholas being the man that he is, would he have the, would he have had the foresight, or would he just be uh, hoping that if this is something we don't deal with because we would eventually uh, evolve the learning and how reliant we are? Yeah, I I think the national grid, which was almost like an accidental solution uh, to uh, uh, alternating current. I don't think that Nikola Tesla ever dreamed that it was going to be so pervasive as it, it became. And uh, like any time that you have something that really works, you work it until you break it. And uh, uh, whether uh, Tesla would have been Involved, I think he, mentally and, and uh, philosophically, he would have been involved in trying to discover uh, more uh, reliable ways to make the national grid. But you have seen that uh, how a uh, interruption in the grid has a, a rolling effect that it causes hundred times more problems than was really started. Uh, it just, it just was a problem that came after Tesla was available to do the work. I'm just wondering if, um, obviously Nikola Tesla's inventions are being suppressed, and if he did not come to America, obviously he wanted to harness the power of Niagara Falls, but if he did not come to America to do that, do you think his inventions elsewhere in the world, if he worked elsewhere in the world, would have flourished? Well, I think a good idea will flourish anywhere. But I know that it, what Tesla had in mind was the opportunity of America. Uh, you, 
America has been a pretty attractive place. It, it, it's big, has an energetic population, particularly at the times we're talking about uh, when he came uh, to this country. Uh, that uh, it, it, it's the size of the canvas the, paint, the painter wants to use. The size of the canvas in the United States is so much larger than the size even in Germany, which was a technological leader uh, in most of that previous century. Uh, I think that he came purposely to the United States with that in mind, and he had the advantage of having worked for the uh, Edison interest, the French Edison interest, who saw how good he was. Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was the man that they sent to repair the uh, dynamo that blew up when almost killed the Kaiser. <laughs> because it, it, it not built properly and not working properly. But he came with an invitation to, and he accepted that because even Tesla thought that Edison must have been a great man. And uh, he only found out later that uh, Edison uh, was uh, an interesting, interesting person, but uh, great uh, depends how you want to call it. He certainly was innovative in some things, made very good uh, uh, recording devices and toasters and what have you, but uh, serious stuff, he was, he, was, he was out of his league. Uh, the differences between uh, doing, doing something really that had never been even thought of before properly, or doing something just better than the previous thing that was being used. I think that, that the, for almost all Europeans, that America was like the promised land. My father says the same thing, that he was reading his, one of his favorite, favorite authors, was one of these, uh, uh, Zane Gray, uh, who was writing a, a sort of a, a, a novels about uh, uh, a gold rush in Alaska and things of that nature. Uh, my father knew exactly who uh, Mark Twain was uh, uh, because he read his, his book, Mark Twain. His, his books went all over the world and everybody related that. Uh, my father was saying also, and even other people that I've spoken to say, they knew, who, they knew what a Buick was because in all these novels, it appeared that the hero was driving a Buick, an American Buick automobile. So they all knew what a Buick was. It, it just, it, this country was so attractive, uh, particularly in that age of enormous immigration uh, that ended in the beginning of the Second World, or First World War. Uh, it, everybody was interested in coming to America and Tesla had that in his mind, I think, as uh, almost as a child. The question you asked was if he had made these inventions in Europe, in France that he might have made, or in Germany, uh, that uh, yes, I think they would have found a very good market. Uh, whether the uh, market would have expanded as quickly as it did in the United States, uh, that is a, a, a philosophical question. Uh, uh, it, it, good ideas will out. Good ideas will out. And Tesla came up with lots of good ideas. Yeah, okay, next question. Uh, Mr. Gerbo, uh, sort of a two-part question. One is, um, was Nikola Tesla a happy man? Do you think, especially towards the end of his life, do you think that he had regrets or looked back at his years um, with any sort of regret or sadness? Um, and also, what do you think the legacy is? Uh, how will history remember Nikola Tesla? How would, how would you like Nikola Tesla to be remembered? And especially, I think, in lieu of um, his eccentricities that we've all read about. Okay, there's about a, four parts in the question, but I'll see if I can, I can handle them. The first part, was he a happy man? He, uh, Nikola Tesla, I know in comparing with my father, who said these things 
specifically to myself, was a, uh, generally had a very good attitude. Uh, he uh, made friends, he was gregarious, he was, uh, it, people always thought that he was like a driven, uh, uh, controlled person. But when things were really going very well for him, he was happy and, and uh, appreciating the opportunities that he had from the successes that he had. Now, as he is, it became difficult for him to attract the, the money he needed for inventions that he had. He always had some good inventions. But as he mentioned uh, to many people, to my father specifically, he says that uh, I can, as he, he said to my father particularly, he says, I can shovel the money out the window faster than it can come in the door. So uh, he had brilliant ideas, but brilliant ideas in his later life took large amounts of money. So he was not happy, not happy, but it wasn't that he was unhappy and mournful. It was that he accepted the difficulties that he had. My father had the same, same problem, that he was enormous success with, with his uh, automotive designs and uh, things of that nature. Uh, but he had the same problem in that uh, with Tesla, J.P. Morgan owned the patents. Tesla was not clever in figuring out how to uh, set ownership of patents, and he let uh, Morgan have the patents. My father had some very good inventions, and when he made improvements on those inventions, his own patents were being cited against him as, uh, as a priority, uh, information priority. And my father was, yes, he, he was inventive to the end of his life, but he was unhappy in that he did not have the financial resources that he expected to have uh, through completely different arrangements, but he, he was not happy. And really, I think that my father could have lived, he lived to 87. I think if he'd had more energy that he would have made 95 because he, we come from a, a gene stock that is uh, really remarkable. Uh, and I hope that I'm going to uh, uh, be happy. I'm happy always. It, it drives my wife crazy because uh, uh, he says, uh, you know, uh, you are, uh, you're too nice to, to, uh, to uh, when I'm in, in uh, 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 McDonald's or something, I, I treat the, uh, uh, this uh, poor, uh, difficult lady who is forced to work there, I treat her with the same respect I would treat anybody and joke with them a little bit because it, it's, it doesn't cost extra to, be fun, to have fun. And uh, if you have fun at nobody's particular expense or rather at giving some uh, extra energy to the person that you're speaking to, that's, uh, that is the best, way, the best way of living your life. Uh, I hope I'm never going to be uh, um, disappointed. I'm not, I'm not built that way, uh, but I, as, as I say, I'm limping like a, like a, a drunken now these last three days. I haven't, I haven't, I have steel in my leg. That's another whole story about uh, trying to take over a company that was being run by a, a real bona fide crook. Uh, you say, people ask me, do I have a, a uh, a biography or a memoir or something that I want to write. I just listen, I got three or four that I can write because I have dealt with some remarkable people and not all of them have been worthy. Some, some have been really bona fide crooks, but clever crooks, clever crooks. And I, uh, I was trying to straighten out the company uh, speaking to people who had invested, billionaires who had invested real money in these things, and to tell them that, uh, uh, watch out, uh, I'm, I'm now checking out this company and it is a fraud. And uh, unfortunately, I, when I make presentations like this, I stayed up two nights in a row and drove from Los Angeles down to uh, uh, 
uh, high rent area and down even to a more high rent area of where these all the millionaires are. And I simply went to sleep at the wheel coming back home and uh, just about killed myself. Uh, but uh, even in that, <laughs> I found some humor in that too. <laughs> I said, son of a gun. I only got depressed one time when I, when, uh, uh, I was invited to a uh, uh, Hollywood party because I, I was dealing with these people all the time. And uh, a very famous director who was now somewhat disabled, he still was very famous. I won't mention his name, but. Uh, and he saw me on crutches. I was on crutches because I, I was 10 months on crutches. I, I broke both legs and everything else. But uh, so we sat down and talked for, the, for most of the evening while all of these uh, uh, starlets and what have you, because it, it, he was, a star was uh, one of his favorites. And the daughter of that star was throwing this party. And that daughter had traveled with her sister on all filming that she'd done. She was a rather well-known actress. And I'll tell you that uh, I went home after that and I got a little depressed. Because I was saying, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not mixing it up with all these uh, uh, well-known actresses. I'm mixing it up with this uh, director who is uh, in a problem of going a little bit blind. And what good is a blind director? But he was, he still had a lot of energy, but a famous, a famous guy. And I said, Let's Okay, see. we have a one, okay. five minutes. Okay, oh, okay, one more question. And Mr. Turbo, thank you for coming to Canada. I greatly appreciate you being here uh, and bringing us uh, a little closer to Nikola Tesla. Uh, clearly, uh, you are traveling around, and even then out here, uh, helping to bring you here helps us to understand a little bit what we call a Tesla. The question really is this, what can we do? Uh, there is a gentleman by the name of John Wagner, and he told me about four or five years ago, it is not sufficient for Tesla to be celebrated among the Serbs. He has to be recognized in the United States. So the question really is, what can we in North America do to help get Tesla more recognition. Clearly what you're doing is helping. What else do you think we as people can do to uh, help that cause? Well, I, again, the recognition of Tesla's contributions to society as we know it. His contributions were so in, important uh, early in, in the uh, 20th century. Uh, but it, 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 it just to, to reinforce the idea that a lot of the things that we take for granted came from the brain of Nikola Tesla. Is this John Wagner that is, I've known for 25 years myself? I do believe it is. And who's a member of my society? <laughs> Though he, he withdrew from the society because, but he, he, did, he did something very positive. He, he uh, collected money on his own to build a bus of Nikola Tesla, and he has them now, and I think in 16 19, prominent, 19, 19, 19 prominent universities. And I sent him a message. He doesn't want to hear messages anymore. He, he's, he says, enough with the messages. But uh, uh, I did send him a message, and he responded. I was surprised. Uh, and But he, he did mention something very similar to what you said, that, uh, that what he was doing was, was uh, a, a solid positive thing for Tesla, putting it in principal universities, that top level of universities uh, around. And if, if that simply was an inspiration to somebody to say, who is that guy with this, could, it's a very nice bust of Tesla, who is this guy? If that's enough interest for that person to uh, choose a career that might be in the technology area. I spend a lot of time myself. I don't have time to, to waste, I'll tell you. That, that's the problem. I, I'm really pressed on time. But I deal with National History Day. And I have one, one 
I believe that any kid that is going to write about his favorite person, I've seen over the last 30 years the difference. It used to be when in, uh, the most famous person you want to write a story about the most famous you know. It used to be Babe, Babe Ruth. He says it used to be Babe Ruth, three Babe Ruths to one Tesla. Now it's three Teslas to one Babe Ruth. And if any kid is clever enough and, and has the, the uh, brilliance in his mind to go to the internet, find out who I am, what my relation to Tesla is, to give me a call on the telephone and tell me what he's doing. And I have a regular pattern of how I deal with these people because I deal with them, been dealing with them now for almost 30 years. And I have one now that is already uh, in the finals in Washington. Uh, he's already gone through the, the county, the state, everything else, and now he's, uh, only trouble is that there are 250 people that are in the finals, but in his area, it's only 80. So he's one of 80, uh, uh, but he, he, a clever, clever kid. By pattern, when I deal with these people, I say, okay, I'm going to give you as much information as you can. We'll talk on the telephone. I've had actually somebody come down to have to, with her parents to make a video of me to, to put in their, in their uh, uh, entry to the, this idea of the National History Day. Uh, that uh, I'm going to give you all the information I can give you, and I'm going to answer your questions, and I'm going to give you background of the answer to the questions, and I'm going to spend a lot of time. What I want you to do, uh, my requirement, one, have a recording device available so that we can talk and you don't have to scribble answers. You can get your answers later. That uh, when you make your entry, whether it's for the state or for the school or whatever high, higher level it is, for the county, the state, whatever it is, I want a copy of what you submitted just a copy of exactly what you submitted. If it's in, in uh, vi partly video or partly pictures or photo, I want a copy of that. And if you don't get an A marking on your thing, I want you to give me the name of your teacher because I'm going to speak to her and say that if, the, if, the, if this kid has the ingenuity to think of how he's going to do something that really is more involved than looking in a dictionary and uh, copying stuff out like politicians do when they start uh, talking about Tesla. They, I can tell exactly what, uh, what uh, encyclopedia they were reading or what book they were reading to get their, their copy to, uh, to essentially uh, steal their ideas. Uh, but when kids are doing that, it's special. And I say that any kid that I deal with that, is, that I have helped in that manner, that I expect that kid to do something really positive. As, and it's the young, the young ones, because I'm old. It's the young ones that are going to do what needs to be done to get this country back into the way of, of graduating science-oriented science people. This country has given up a lot of people. You know, mathematics, if you, you can't be an engineer. You can't be, I can give you examples, but a, a good example. You can't be an engineer if you don't have a facility with mathematics. You don't have to know everything. You have to just know something. You have to have something in your head that works. With Tesla, he was counting things in threes. When I, I, I try to walk two miles at least three times a week or every day that the weather is decent. And uh, because sometimes we walk on a sidewalk around the, uh, we live in a closed community with uh, uh, lots of townhouses and we walk on the outside, that's two miles. If it, the weather's not good and we have to walk where they park the cars, that's two and a half miles. I am, my wife thinks I'm crazy that I'm counting the cars as we walking there where the cars are parked. I'm not just counting the cars, how many cars? I'm counting how many cars, how do they fit in the percentage of cars to the number of townhouses that are associated with those parked cars? And so I'm not even thinking about walking. By the time I finish doing all this counting, it's, I've got seven different areas to, to make all this counting in, and I'm taking, keeping track of, of how many have, uh, 
50% of the cars and 75% of the cars parked uh, in relation to the number of units that are involved. I, my wife thinks I'm crazy and she's probably right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All, all your story are finished with your wife. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>